Hey guys, it's hey Libby, guys, and today I'm going to be talking about three plays by George Bernard Shaw. These are all from fairly early in his career, sort of the turn of the century, um, and we think of Shaw as a Belle Epoque playwright, but he actually didn't die until 1950, and he continued writing well into the 40s. The plays that I read were Mrs. Warren's Profession, Major Barbara, and The Doctor's Dilemma. I also read Pygmalion from a little bit later in his career, but I have enough to say about that that it's getting its own video. Now, if you've been following my series on modernist playwrights, you'll know that I've also recently read some of the works of Anton Chekhov and Henrik Ibsen, and reading Shaw sort of helped me understand or contextualize their plays a little bit better. Um, I would say that Chekhov's plays end with a period, Ibsen's plays end with an exclamation point, and Shaw's plays end with a question mark. I'm not referring to the actual final punctuation, but rather to the um, attitude that you have when you leave the theater or close the book. George Bernard Shaw uses theater to explore one single issue and the characters there present many sides. And by the end of the play they haven't really reconciled. Shaw doesn't directly come out and say what the right answer to this ethical dilemma is. And I think he's just trying to promote conversation rather than, you know, yell like Ibsen. So starting with Mrs. Warren's Profession, this is the earliest play of Shaw's that I read, and it's also probably the simplest. At the heart of this play is a mother-daughter relationship between Mrs. Kitty Warren and her daughter Vivi. Vivi is a very modern young lady. She has a degree in mathematics from Cambridge University, um, and she also has a job. She kind of has a romantic relationship going on, but she's rather cold and serious in regards to this. She and her mother don't know each other particularly well because Mrs. Warren sent Vivi away to be raised elsewhere because, as we learned, Mrs. Warren was a prostitute and she is now a madam, meaning she owns a bunch of brothels. Kitty Warren is the opposite of her daughter in many ways. She's fun and warm-hearted and a bit flirtatious, and she's looking forward to being able to spend time with her daughter now that she's graduated from a university. And she wants them to live together so that she can financially support her daughter, because even though Vivi has a job, she doesn't make a lot of money. In the play, Vivi finds out about Mrs. Warren's profession and refuses to have anything to do with her or this money that has been made immorally. I think that Shaw takes Mrs. Warren's side a little bit more than Vivi's. He makes it clear, and even Vivi accepts, that in their society it's very difficult for a woman to be financially independent and prostitution and madamship that the word brothel owning um, is kind of the only option that a woman has to have a um, successful career. And it's also an interesting look at um, intergenerational relationships. Normally you think of the younger generation as the sexually progressive one going out having all of these scandals and disappointing their parents rather than the other way around. I gave Mrs. Warren's profession four to five stars. The next play that I read was Major Barbara and it is really good. <laughs> I'd actually seen this one on stage before, but I was really surprised at how good it was when I read it, um, mainly because I completely forgot everything that happened in the third act. And the first act, I was pretty distracted um, by the fact that Major Barbara is not a major in the army, she's a major in the Salvation Army, so it's quite a different story than what I was expecting. This is definitely an evolution off of Mrs. Warren's profession. The premise is very similar. The Undershaft family chiefly consists of Lady Britomart Undershaft. Yes, her first name is Britomart. What were her parents thinking? She has three children, Stephen, Barbara, and Sarah, and she is still married to her husband, but they have separated because of um, ethical differences. Mr. Undershaft has become very rich as a weapons manufacturer. He creates bombs and bullets, and the family is not too excited about this. Mrs. Undershaft isn't quite so bothered by the fact that her husband manufactures weapons. She's more bothered about his inheritance scheme. So the Undershaft company has traditionally been run in a very strange way. The owner never gives it to his own son, even if he has one. Instead, he adopts a foundling and gives the company to him. And Mrs. Undershaft thinks that the company and all of the money should go to their son, Stephen, but Mr. Undershaft insists that um, it would be unethical of him to do that since he himself was a foundling and was um, given this great wealth by his predecessor. It's a pay-it-forward situation. 
Meanwhile, Barbara, even though she could in theory have lots of money, works very hard at a Salvation Army shelter. The Salvation Army was an evangelical Christian movement not associated with the Church of England, which was the standard religion in England, as you might expect. Barbara is very good at helping people and getting them to turn their lives around, mainly for Jesus. But uh, the Salvation Army as a whole is run very much on a shoestring budget. They're entirely dependent on donations. So Barbara's struggle begins when her father and other um, very rich men who made their money, um, not, not unethically, but in an unethical line of trade, in Barbara's opinion, um, offer to donate very large sums of money. The head of the Salvation Army argues that it doesn't matter where the money comes from, they'll be able to feed and take care of so many people with the money that they get. Um, Barbara doesn't want to sell out, though. And interestingly, Mr. Undershaft sort of jabs her, um, saying that it's very easy to convert people to Christianity when they're starving and you're giving them bread. And he sort of dares her to come uh, convert his employees who he pays well and they have nice lives. This may, in fact, be a perfect play. Every line is exactly as it should be, either contributing humor, dealing with the ethics of the situation, or advancing the plot oftentimes all three at the same time. And Mr. Undershaft is a completely fascinating character. He spends all of his time talking about he doesn't have ethics, he just believes in practicality. Um, at one point, a character asks him what his religion is, and he says, I am a millionaire, that is my religion. But he also has this deep-seated belief that it is his ethical duty to pass on the company, not to his son, but to someone who would have nothing otherwise. I gave it 5 out of 5 stars. It's a good place to start with Shaw, and it's a good place to start with Edwardian literature in general. And the last play I read was The Doctor's Dilemma, where we will continue to talk about ethics. Shaw was very into ethics, although this one is not so much financial ethics. The protagonist of this play is Dr. Colenso Ridgen, which is quite a name. Um, he has developed a new method for treating tuberculosis, which was a very deadly disease um, at the turn of the century, uh, and also like for a long time before the turn of the century. Tuberculosis, not fun. And I'm not t totally sure how accurate Shaw's understanding of medicine is, either in actuality or according to the understandings of the time, um, but um, he has this compli complicated treatment process um, but he has limited resources, so he can only take 10 patients at a time. It's a five-act play, and the first act is much longer than all the other ones. In this act, we get introduced to a bunch of other doctor friends of Dr. Ridgens. He has recently been given a knighthood, and they're all coming to give their con congratulations and talk about their own thoughts on medicine. I think this act would mean more when it was actually performed as opposed to now. You can tell that Shaw is doing caricatures of the types of doctors that existed and the types of medical philosophies there were, um, but that doesn't really mean anything to a modern audience. So if I were going to direct a version of this, I would cut down the first act a lot. But at the end of the first act, a woman shows up. Her name is Jennifer, and her husband has tuberculosis, and she asks Dr. Ridgen um, to treat him. He says that his clinic is already full up, and he doesn't have the time or the space to give to any new patients. Um, she shows him some art that her husband has done. He's a very skilled painter and sketcher. And she says, look, my husband can create such beautiful things. Surely he's more worthy to live than one of the patients you currently have. Can't you turn over one of your current patients to another doctor um, who is um, less likely to be able to cure them and, and you know, save my husband. Dr. Ridgen eventually says yes, he will bump one of his other patients over to another of his doctor friends who he knows um, isn't that good at medicine um, and take on um, Jennifer's husband. Partly because he does think his art is beautiful and partly because he thinks Jennifer is beautiful. Over the next two acts, we all get acquainted with Jennifer's husband, Lewis, and we learn that even though he is a great painter, he is maybe not the best person. He's not exactly a confidence trickster, but he manages to get other people to give him quite a lot of money without really the expectation of getting paid back. Um, he also tricked Jennifer into marrying him. Um, she thinks their marriage is legal, but it actually is not. They are both bigamists. He's also a bit slimy in how he sort of uses his wife to flirt with other men. 
She's never there, but whenever he wants to get something out of someone, he'll say, oh, by the way, my wife thinks you're great. She rather fancies you. Can I have a hundred pounds? Dr. Ridgen gets more and more disgusted with him, um, and eventually he learns that another doctor friend of his who's very poor also has tuberculosis and that he could save his life, and he kind of changes his mind. He's also aware of the fact that if Lewis died, Jennifer would be free to marry again. Maybe a certain doctor with a skill for curing tuberculosis. I'm not going to spoil the end for you because it is rather unexpected and it is also excellent. He takes a trope from 19th and early 20th century literature that often makes people kind of uncomfortable and uh, it basically calls it out for what it is, which is really satisfying if you've read a lot of classics. I gave this play four out of five stars. It is very good most of the time. However, as I said, act one is a bit more drawn out than I would care to experience. Um, and also, I found it a little bit unbelievable how quickly all of the doctors were seduced by Lewis's artwork. Um, even when he was evidently being a terrible person, they would say, but he does paint real good. In fact, at one point, um, one of Dr. Ridgen's colleagues says to him, would you rather live in a world full of good men or good paintings? And Dr. Ridgen is like, I don't know, I might rather live in the world with the good paintings. And I'm like, I don't think that would actually happen. <laughs> so that about wraps it up for these three plays. Um, they all are good places to start with Edwardian literature or with drama. Um, Shaw did intend his plays to be read as well as performed, so he has a lot of um, content for the reader. Um, one character in Major Barbara is described as um, she looks 60 but she's probably 45 and I'm like how would you portray that on a stage when you have to have an actor who's either 60 or 45 um, but that's a cue for whoever is reading the text of his play. Um, these would also be really good works for uh, book clubs because A, they're short and we all know there's always that one person who doesn't finish the book club book, but you can get through these in like an hour or two. And also it brings up a lot of interesting discussion points for ethics. Thanks very much for watching guys. I'll see you again soon with a video on Pygmalion.